Probably I should say it one more time. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. That's the spirit. That's the spirit. A blonde and a brunette are in a car. And the brunette mentioned that Christmas falls on a Friday this year. The blonde says, oh, no, not on Friday. I hope it's not the 13th. <laughs> yeah, some of you got it. Um, don't worry, even if Christmas Eve is on Friday, I promise you it's not going to be 13 this year. I thought it was a nice joke. Uh, actually, my lovely wife texted to me a couple of days ago. There is your joke for Sunday. But today we are going to continue our series uh, about celebrating the name of Jesus. Two weeks ago, uh, Kelly... Uh, talked about this uh, wonderful counselor, uh, Jesus, and um, accessible, affordable, and also the best counselor because he knows us better than we know ourselves. And it's so amazing to go to a counselor that understands you, that knows you, why you think how you think, why you act as you act, and can counsel you, can guide you. Last week, we talked about the second name that we see in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and that is um, Mighty God. And we look at Mighty God like his strength, his power, also Jesus as a hero, and also Jesus as a warrior. Now we are going to look at Jesus, third name that we see in uh, this verse, Jesus, Everlasting Father. And this name is the most misunderstood, in my opinion, because in the Bible verse that we are going to look at, it's mentioned this. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In one Bible verse, we can see clearly that it's called a child is born, a son is given, and then it's called the everlasting father. And can be confusing sometimes. When I think about those four names that Isaiah mentioned here, in my opinion is that the wonderful counselor, we can see his support, because that's what the counselor does, support you to go through life. When we look at the mighty God, the second name, I see it as his power. When we are looking at everlasting father, I'm thinking about his heart that he has for us. When we are looking at the Prince of Peace, well, that's for next Sunday. Prince of Peace in the purpose, it's, has the purpose of us to live peacefully uh, with God. But I'll talk more about that next Sunday. According to the old Jewish custom, the older brother was the father of the family in the absence of the father. So the oldest son always stepped in when the father was gone and just become as a father in the house. That Jewish tradition. In the absence of the father, the firstborn took precedence of all and took upon him the father's position. So Jesus the firstborn, as we can see, Apostle Paul is calling him in Colossians like this. The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So we can see very clear that he is called the firstborn. And because he is a firstborn, because he is the oldest, he's assuming that responsibility as the father. Jesus exercises to us a father's office. And everlasting father here represent, in my opinion, the heart of the father. When Jesus came to the earth to save us from our sin, he also came to deliver us from fears. And so he wasn't just a wonderful counselor and the mighty God. He is also an everlasting father. And actually in Hebrew, the everlasting father if you translate from Hebrew literally, will be father of eternity. Think about it. 
if you translate everlasting father, the Hebrew word, becomes father of eternity. And that's what Jesus did, actually. He created a way for us to have eternity. He fathered us in eternity to be able to spend our eternity with God. There is no confusion here. It's not like Jesus is the eternal father. It's not God the father. It's that Jesus is the author and creator of life, the sustainer of life, and he is the one who will father us in eternity or prepare us for eternity. Where, when we are thinking about Jesus as everlasting father, we should think more like Jesus that has an everlasting heart like his father. An everlasting heart as a good, good father. In ancient times, the father of the nation was viewed in the same way as the father of a family. It was a father who was to protect and provide for his children. In the same way, this child to be born will become a king who will be a father to the children of Israel, and later on to everyone that gives their life to Christ or becomes a believer. He will protect and provide for them, and his role as a protector and provider will not be limited by aging or death, because it's everlasting. His role as a father, protector, and provider will be, and will be forever. The disciples had a hard time understanding this also, how the relation is everlasting father and who is God the father. And they had a little hard time understanding the relation between Jesus the son and God the father. I'm going to read a quick passage from the Bible from John 14. So Jesus was talking with the disciple and was telling them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip, one of the disciples, said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Where Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip? And yet, you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or... At least believe because of the work you have seen me doing. This ex explains so clearly that actually Jesus has a heart just like the Father. And they are one and the same. They are not the same as individuals, but they share the same desire, the same heart that he, they have for his creation. For some of us, idea of a good father might be confusing because me personal, I grew up in an abusive uh, family, actually with an abusive father, a wonderful mom, but I grew up with an abusive father. And a father that uh, beat us, uh, abused us, uh, abused us uh, emotional, uh, uh, abused us uh, with language and uh, hit us and beat us and tried to kill my older brother. Uh, in front of us in the living room, and I had a hard time understanding what a good, good father actually is. In my opinion, when I was a kid, a good, good father will be a father that won't beat me, won't abuse me uh, emotional, won't speak terrible things to me, and will just not act like that. But actually, a good, good father, it's more than that. It's providing, it's protecting, it's going the extra mile for his children. And this is Jesus' heart. This is, this is why he is called everlasting father. A good father 
does at least four things. And if you read the Old Testament, if you read the New Testament, if you read any psychology books, we'll realize that a good father provides for his family, a good father protects his family, a good father instructs or teach his family, and a good father listens and takes care of the hurts and the needs in the process. Let's look together at a few Bible verses and see how Jesus actually did all of those and provided all of those in uh, his life here on earth and, and also through um, the Old Testament and New Testament. Let's look at his action and let his action speak for us. Jesus, everlasting father, Jesus that has an everlasting heart of a good, good father, provide for his children. God's kingdom here, here on, God's kingdom is different than kingdom on this earth or this world. Because in this world, we have to fight really hard to provide. We have to go the extra miles and God's kingdom is different. Actually, he said, I will provide for you everything that you need. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 31 and 32. There do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't go to work. I'm not saying don't uh, bring food home. I'm not saying have a job. Because even when God provided manna for Israelites in a uh, desert, they had to go outside. They had to pick it up. It was not just showing like this on the table. It was not, you know, out of a, a bottle like a genie, put everything there. God wants us to do our part. But also God wants us to trust in him and don't be anxious about this. Apostle Paul is saying it like this in Philippians 4.19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He is the provider. We can see it so clearly. And he wants to provide for us. Jesus provided also through his birth a beginning, a path for us to have eternal life. Jesus always provided what we need. We have to learn to trust in him little more every day. Because let's be honest, it's really little hard to trust in him when you don't have a job. It's little hard to trust in him when you don't see it, where it's coming from. I mentioned a few weeks ago, I grew up with not having a lot because I grew up in Romania, which was a socialist communist country. And you're supposed to be in lines for hours to be able to buy bread and eggs. And if you are lucky and the food will not end before you get in front of the line. And many times we had to really, literally, just pray for our dinner. Because there was no refrigerator was running, was using electricity, but was nothing in it. And we prayed at 5 o'clock, and probably by 5.30, 6 o'clock, somebody will knock on the door and brought us a big meal. And you know what? We didn't have a lot, but we never, ever went hungry to bed because God always provided for us. I'm sure many of you have the same stories probably going through life that God provided one way or the other. Number two that a good, good father will do, this Jesus everlasting father, Jesus that has an everlasting heart of a good, good father, protect his children. Probably it's not a story I should share, but uh, kids don't do what I did. I learned my own lesson. But when I was a kid, I was, due to my... Uh, Situation home, I grew up to be a very angry child. Uh, so don't try to push my buttons. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I got changed when, God, when I give my life to Christ. But when I was around probably 
sixth, seventh grade. My sister, which is just uh, three years older, uh, younger than me, uh, was picked by a guy in her class. I found out about that, and during the class, I just went. Uh, I knock on the door, I open the door, enter the class, and I apologize to the teacher. There was one teacher and around 30 kids in that class. I apologize to the, to the teacher because I have something to take care of. I went, walked all the way to the back of the room, and I talked with this kid. You do not ever, do not ever, ever pick on my sister. That's my sister. And I hit the guy. So then I walk outside. I thank the teacher <laughs> for allowing me to take care of the problem. And here I went. I think the teacher was in shock, probably, because she didn't say a word. So for this reason, I say, don't do that, because I paid for what I did. But I thought I am the protector right, for my younger sister. But actually, a protector doesn't necessarily punish the others. A protector is more than punishing the other kids or the other people that did something wrong to us. A protector is guarding, placing safeguards around us and protecting us. God's protection is not just for our physical needs. His protection is also for our souls, for our minds, and everything that God is trying to do in our life is to protect us, to help us. Isaiah is saying this in 41, chapter 41, 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is going to protect his children because he is a good, good father. Another story coming in my mind is that I was driving in a vehicle, uh, in a small car with my grandma and grandpa going to a different city uh, for a couple hours. So I drove on this out of nowhere. It was just fields on the left, fields on the right, um, in the middle of the winter time. And as I was driving, uh, I'm kind of a fast driver, uh, driving my wife insane sometimes, but it's uh, probably the most prayer that she did was in the car with me. <laughs> um, so I drove, we were driving, and I started seeing cars on the right, cars on the left, out of, you know, in the middle of the field. I'm like, man, that is weird. Before I said, oh, this is weird, we hit black ice. The car did an 180 degrees, so I was going backwards on the road. I put it in the neutral because we didn't have one of those automatic uh, shifts. So I put it in neutral, and then for probably 20, 30 seconds, I just drove backwards on the road. And it was amazing that actually we did stay on the road. I'll be honest with you, it's not because I have mad skills, because probably I don't. Well, I have some, but not that good. It's not because I was really good at driving backwards. It was because I believe God protected us. We slowed down, we turned around the car and kept going. And that day, I recognized that God's protection is upon each one of us. Many times we don't see it but it is there. And I'm sure many of you have stories like that. Maybe working, maybe uh, traveling, maybe driving. God keep, kept his hands upon you. And it's because he is a good, good father. Number third that I want to cover that Jesus did as an everlasting father is that he was teaching his disciples. Jesus, everlasting father, Jesus that has an everlasting heart of a good, good father, teaches his children. Jesus has this ability to instruct, to teach us. Actually, Jesus was called the greatest teacher because he loved to teach people to have a better life through God. 
Did you ever ask yourself why God was called the great teacher? Probably because of all the experience he had, right? Hundreds of years. But actually, when he came, when he came down here on earth, he left all those qualities in heaven. So he didn't have hundreds of hundreds of years of experience as a teacher when he came on earth. If we are looking in one of the Bible verses, uh, when Jesus was 12 years old, we find him in the temple where he was listening to the religious teacher and he was asking them questions. From a very young age, he was like, I want to know more, tell me more. And he was asking questions. I love little kids asking questions. Sometimes it's really annoying, especially when you have a two or three years old. Why, why, why dad, why, why, why? Just because I told you so, just do it. But the kids love to have that, they wanna know why. We as adults should keep having the same attitude in our life, to keep asking God. We live in a culture that where, when we are asking, we can be perceived as judging. And it's a difference between asking questions and questioning things, are two completely different things. When we ask questions, it's about we want to know more. When we are questioning things, we assume something is wrong or something is not right. Jesus loved to talk to us. Also, he loved to listen to us. For this reason, he's a great teacher because he loved listening to us. And it's perfect okay to go with questions to him because he loves it. And you know what? He will answer the question. Sometimes he might answer them in the Bible. So once in a while, it's good to open the Bible and read because the answers are right there. But also sometimes it's good to just go to him in prayer and ask him because he is going to answer. So, Jesus taught various people in various places. I think that's why he's a great teacher. But the most important reason why he was such a great teacher is because he was compassionate. And he thought by placing people first. He was not trying to bring people down. He was trying to lift people up. And that's why he was a great teacher. He cared for them. After one of those sessions of teaching, without projector, without microphones, without uh, stage, just on a hill in the middle of the wilderness, surrounded by crowds, we read in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28. When Jesus had finished saying these things that he was teaching the crowds, the crowds were amazed at his teachings. Can you imagine? I had many teachers in my life, and some of them were pretty boring. Some classes, some teachings, I was just, come on, where is the break? I'm done here. If you are looking at Jesus' teachings, he was captivating the audience. He was inspiring them. He was uh, empowering them because he was compassionate and he was caring for them. And this is the heart of a good, good father. This is an everlasting father, Jesus Christ. Something else that a good, good father does, or this Jesus with an everlasting heart of a good father does, it's taking care of our needs. And when I'm saying our needs, I'm not talking about just food and clothing, like we read and we talked about earlier. I'm talking about all kind of needs that we might have. Matthew 15, chapter 15, verse 29 and 30 said this. Jesus returned to the Sea of Galilee and climbed a hill and sat down. A vast crowd brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. They laid them before Jesus, and he healed them all. The crowd was amazed. 
Those who hadn't been able to speak were talking, the crippled were made well, the lame were walking, and the blind could see again. And they praised the, good, the God of Israel. Jesus provided all their needs. And also we have in the New Testament a couple of stories where he was even miraculously providing food for them, for those crowds, to be sure they are not just their physical needs are met like miracles and healing, but also their needs for food were met. In this story, something that is interesting about this story is that we don't see anywhere in this story Jesus saying, oh, you need to repent. Oh, you need to uh, give your life to Christ. Oh, you need to be baptized in the water. Oh, you need to do this and this and this and this. No. In this story, we don't see any of that. It's just Jesus' heart as a good, good father providing for the needs of Israel, providing for the needs of his children. And you know what? Sometimes God will provide for the needs of other people that are not believers. I like to call them a, a pre-believer. They are going to believe eventually. <laughs> they are going to come around because it's almost impossible to not come around to understand who God is when you see all those characteristics that he's fulfilling in his, um, in his life. We see Jesus caring for his children's needs as a good, good father. You know what? Sometimes, even as a parent, we are like, well, I'm going to give you this if you do your homework, if you do your chores, and by the way, don't forget to vacuum the living room and uh, clean the bathrooms, and, and then you can have dessert. Right? It's nothing wrong with that. Don't get, don't get me wrong. I like to bribe our kids. But God sometimes is just providing for our needs without us having to do anything. And because he provided for us, because we feel his heart, because we uh, experience his everlasting heart as a good, good father, then we turn around and like, you know what? I don't want to disappoint him. I don't want to make him sad. Or I want to bring joy in his life. The same he brings joy in my life. And what we are doing is not because we are forced, not because we are feeling guilty, and we do it because of this relation that we want to have with Jesus. I would like to just bring it a little home and ending with the three names that we studied so far. The wonderful counselor, which it is his support for us. Mighty God, which is his power, his strength, his warrior on our behalf. And today, everlasting Father, which is actually his heart for each one of us. A heart of a good, good Father. A heart just like his Father in heaven. Two different persons, but sharing the same heart for his creation, for you and me. I would like to end with just giving the opportunity. If you never accepted this Jesus as your heavenly father, if you never understood his heart for you, maybe today you got a small glimpse of what it means to have him as your father, to be that everlasting father, that compassion, that provision, that protection, that desire that they have, that he has to care for you and I. I would like to invite you to just accept him as your savior, accept him as your father. Because you know what? He is a good, good father. So let's stand up together. And if you decided to say like, you know what? I want to have that father. I would like to experience his protection, his blessings. I would like to experience his kindness. I just need to have him as my counselor. 
I would like you to just say a prayer with me. Heavenly Father, Jesus, today I recognize I need you in my life. I try my own ways and I'm tired. I'm discouraged. I have no idea what I'm doing. Today, I choose your ways above my ways. Today, I recognize I need you in my life and I'm giving my life to you. Lead me. Lead me with your good, good Father's heart. Help me understand your blessings and your protection. Help me understand your provision, but beyond everything else, help me understand your heart that you have for me. If you said that prayer today, if you are here in this room, please see us at the back of the auditorium because we want to give you a book, What's Next? Also, if you are watching online, please connect with us via uh, website, go on our website at influence.church and let us know because we would love to mail you this book. This book is going to help you to grow in your relation with God. Let's pray, let's, let's worship with one more song together.